with one of the world's greatest journalists and filmmakers, John Pilger, who has been present at the extradition trial of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange that has been taking place at London's Old Bailey. John, thanks for coming. But if no one knew anything about Julian Assange of WikiLeaks, they might have known about the collateral murder video. They'd mm. have seen the soldiers, American soldiers killing journalists. Why is Julian Assange the one who's at the Old Bailey being tried, not all those people all around the world that, uh, whose war crimes he exposed at WikiLeaks? Well, if it had been about China or Russia or one of the official enemies, that's fine. But this is about us. He gave us too much truth. He made those who committed these war crimes, he forced them to look in the mirror. It's them, it's you. That's his unforgivable crime. That, you see, we don't commit these war crimes. We don't shoot people uh, in, uh, who are unarmed. We don't gun them down and laugh at them. Uh, we don't do all the things that the WikiLeaks, uh, the WikiLeaks video has told us, plus so much else. Our politicians, and in the present circumstances, it's almost a mockery to say so. Our politicians don't really lie. I mean, our press tells us the truth. Our media, by and large, a few things wrong with it, but by and large, uh, is a free media. None of these things are true. And Assange, has, Assange represents what I would say is too much truth. It is the most important political trial of this century, certainly one of the most important of my lifetime. And it's been virtually blacked out by most of the so-called misnamed mainstream media. No surprise to me, but when you sit in court and listen to some of the truly shocking evidence, indisputable evidence, the, just the day, the, what I would call the medical day, describing what Assange has gone through with the evidence of Professor Michael Kopelman and, and, uh, and Professor Kate Humphreys, both of them distinguished neuropsychiatrists, talking about the way this single human being has been punished for telling this truth. That if he goes, if he's sent to the United States, if he's extradited, he'll find a way to take his own life. Um, well, I, I want to get to the psychiatric reports in, in a second, because of course the US prosecutors present there at the uh, Old Bailey trial, cast doubt on the uh, on those uh, prominent uh, well, uh, yes, academics. Well, they cast doubt. They call, I've never heard in this modern age when finally we're recognizing the blight of mental illness, how it touches so many of us, and especially during this uh, coronavirus period. Uh, uh, the, the prosecution, QC, um, attempting to discredit Professor Kopelman's evidence and describe mental illness as malingering. It's like, you know, it's like a Victorian term, as if it didn't happen. Well, also the prosecutor said that he would uh, be less likely to kill himself. Julian Assange would be less likely to kill himself in a United States prison than at Belmarsh Prison in London. Well, of course, yes. Uh, uh, has he been in a US prison? Supermax, I have. I've interviewed people in them. They were described, I think, by Edward Fitzgerald QC, the defense QC, as a clean hell. And that says it perfectly. They're sanitized, wonderfully sanitized, shining. And they are a vision of a true brave new world. And it's there, as so many witnesses made clear, he'd be subject to something called SAMS. It's an acronym for special administrative measures in which he'd be dropped in a hole and not seen again. They he, said not solitary confinement and that, uh, mm. in fact, uh, he would have access to uh, things you, that he you needed. See, the prosecution's arguing against this was, was, was night against day. It was so disingenuous. Well, they didn't quite so, say it was a country club. But so they, so it, was, it was so pathetic. One rightly should be angry about it, but that's the game they play. Uh, Assange, the whole, the whole hearing shouldn't have happened. It should have been thrown out. We had uh, evidence on the, uh, the second last day that uh, Assange had been spied on by a Spanish security company, almost certainly in the pay of the CIA. All his, his confidential deliberations with, uh, with his lawyers and doctors had been spied on and recorded. That would be enough to throw it out. 
In the other famous uh, whistleblower case of Daniel Ellsberg, uh, in 1971, I think it was, and Ellsberg, of course, was one of the witnesses uh, at the Assange trial, uh, it was the fact that Nixon had sent his thugs into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office to try and get some dirt on him. The very thing that the uh, Americans were doing in the Ecuadorian embassy on Assange, that in the Ellsberg trial was enough to throw it. The judge threw it out. David in my case, as I say, day after day, once people started talking, there were revelations of this sort. A CIA profile that had been done on me, for example, to see if I, how I could be manipulated by a psychiatrist uh, or, or somehow uh, defamed in some way, etc. Everything at that time illegal. Unfortunately, since 2011, I'm sorry, 2001, nine years later, after 9-11, all of the things that were done against me by Nixon which led to the ending of my trial, the dropping of charges, and much more importantly, put Nixon on impeachment proceedings. They were major charges against Nixon in his impeachment proceedings, which led to his resignation. All those things are now legalized by the Patriot Act, by other acts, uh, CIA being used for police functions, burglaries, uh, warrantless wiretaps, as I was underheard. They haven't, strictly speaking, said that killing Americans, Julian is Australian, as it happens, even though know, he's being extradited under the Espionage Act to America, we'll get into that later, but I, I was an American. And uh, killing of Americans uh, at that time was uh, regarded as uh, Congress hasn't yet legislated that that's legal. But President Obama, Barack Obama, was meeting, I think, Tuesday mornings. They came out. He didn't, he didn't uh, object, by the way, to this coming out because it showed what a tough, straightforward manager of the empire he was. And uh, it showed he was selecting American, uh, well, people, including American citizens, American-born citizens, for assassination by drones. Anwar al Olaki, an American-born citizen. And I think within two weeks later, his 16-year-old son, who was looking for his father, was assassinated by a drone as a result of this same program. So I had to conclude uh, even that didn't lead to any objection from Congress when it came out. Uh, and uh, apparently that's legal too. So the incapacitation of me is now in this century is something that uh, um, can happen to Americans. That case continues with David Morales and UC Global claim they were protecting Julian Assange. They were hired by the Ecuadorian sure. government to help him. Sure, there goes another pig flying over. Afshin. Describe his average day, Julian Assange's average day. His average day at the moment, and I don't know whether he'll be relieved once this thing is over. <clears throat> he is roused at five o'clock in the morning in Belmarsh. Uh, he is uh, strip searched. He is shackled. Uh, presumably he's allowed to shower and have some prison breakfast. He then endures uh, at least an hour and a half uh, in this torturous drive from Belmarsh to the Old Bailey in what his partner, Stella Morris, has described as something like an upright coffin. I've seen it. It's a great white circo run truck, of course. Uh, and there's a small window at the top. To look out, you have to stand rather precariously. So in this dreadful stop-start traffic, and I've driven it from Belmarsh to the Central Criminal Court, Assange is taken in this, in this box, this, this this prison uh, to, to a court where he, <clears throat> he sits in a glass corridor in which is his guard and himself. And the only way he can speak to his lawyers is to get down on his knees. Time and again, I've watched him because where I've been sitting has been looking down on him. He's got down on his knees to speak through a slit in the, gra in the, in the glass. Uh, to one of the uh, lawyers at the back, and she writes his message on a post-it. The post-it is then handed through the body of the court to the barristers who are arguing the case against his extradition to an American hellhole. That's how he communicates with his lawyers. It's actually slightly better than what it was 
at Westminster Magistrates Court, where he's actually in a glass cage. He's now in a glass corridor. Um, it's so uh, cool would deny it's a coffin and that they carry out their privatised, outsourced British government justice mm. uh, duties all, uh, all brilliantly. Do you think that's the reason why Judge or Magistrate uh, Vanessa Baretza didn't want Amnesty International or Reporters Without Borders present? I mean, why were they not allowed? And they've been tweeting furiously, Reporters Without Borders and I Amnesty don't know. International. I mean, it's good to see both those organisations uh, at last speaking up. Uh, too many organisations, and I'm not necessarily pointing the finger at both of them, but Assange should have been a prisoner of conscience, along with Chelsea Manning a long time ago. It's good to see them protesting at, at this outrage that they weren't allowed in the court. Well, Rebecca Vincent of Reporters Without Borders went so far as to tweet against a BBC journalist, arguably. Well, uh, a BBC journalist said, you see, the reason why you, viewers may have to watch Going Underground to hear about this and not the BBC uh, court report daily from this trial of the century, as people have been calling it, is it was a bit repetitive. Do you know, the inanity and the cynicism in that statement, repetitive, every day has been a description, usually of hell, of the kind of hell that WikiLeaks exposed, the kind of hell to which all of us have a right to know, uh, which is now being imposed on the, on the truth teller himself. And for that BBC journalist to describe it as repetitive uh, doesn't quite leave me speechless, but it leaves me with a sense that um, it's over with much of the media to watch this day after day, this extraordinary, important, trial telling us so much about uh, how those who govern us, those who want to control our lives and what, they, and what they do to other countries, how they lie to us, watch this day after day uh, and see none of it reported. Or if you do see it reported, you'll see uh, something like uh, uh, Assange told to pipe down by the judge on a day, and he only did this two or three times, I don't know how he kept his mouth shut, uh, where he stood up and protested at, at evidence that was, that was clearly um, false and, uh, and offensive to him. That was the headline. That was the story of the day. We didn't get access. What was the judge like? This judge throughout, uh, Vanessa Bracev, she declared against the defence so many times. She imposed a guillotine of half an hour on the... Uh, on defence witnesses' statement, uh, and she gave up to four hours to the uh, to the prosecution for their cross examination. Now I know cross examination usually gets more time, but the disparity between the two is absolutely grotesque. Obviously, the Crown Prosecution Service will deny all of that. The Guardian newspaper was referred to time and time again as uh, a uh, particularly an two element. members. Luke Harding this. and David Lee. David wow. Lee, who was entrusted the uh, uh, a secret password to uh, uh, some of the WikiLeaks files and published it. And they published it in their book. But yet The uh, Guardian has been saying that Julian Assange, or at least printing stories about Julian Assange being the problem because he didn't redact data from WikiLeaks cables that were released, thus endangering people around the world. Why what is, excuse me for interrupting, but what has come through perhaps more powerfully than anything is that Assange went out of his way to protect informants, to redact. Daniel Ellsberg said he redacted 15,000 files. The distinguished investigative journalist Nikki Hager, who worked with Assange on this, said watched him taking the most extraordinary precautions with uh, with, with the material. People thought Assange was paranoid yeah. for wanting to redact so I much. Would, I would suggest <laughs> those who didn't redact perhaps are on the other side, certainly not on Assange's side. I've known for, for years the extent to which Julian Assange went to redact and tried to redact and worked through the night to redact and couldn't and wasn't allowed to. So much of this has come out in court and ought to have been reported. But why would The Guardian not be reporting about The Guardian at the Old Bailey on its front page. Well, perhaps The Guardian has something to hide or even something to fear. And do you think, uh, do you think 
there are many people at many publications that feel this way. I mean, this is who... No one is who, telling The Guardian directly, do not cover the Assange look, or the I, I don't hearing. really want to concentrate. The Guardian's behavior through all this, its campaign of vilification against Assange, the way they turned on their source, the way they, because he wouldn't be part of their collusive club, uh, uh, has been a disgrace. They know it's been a disgrace. The way they published articles like the one that said that Trump advisor Paul Manafort uh, and Russians visited Assange. It never happened. There's been no apology from The Guardian. I think it's not just The Guardian. There are many other newspapers that have found, some actually behave rather honorably, I think. I think it was good to hear from the uh, investigative reporter, uh, uh, John Gertz, who was the investigations editor, I think, of Der Spiegel in Germany. Uh, he spoke very clearly. He also refuted a story that Assange, which is in the Harding uh, Lee book, that Assange uh, ha had, had, had said that um, uh, it, it was quite a good thing that some of these informants were harmed. Uh, Goethe, Harding and Lee were not at this uh, dinner at which Assange was meant to have said this, but John Goethe was. And he said, and said uh, Assange said nothing of the kind. Now, Judge Baretza wouldn't allow Goertz to actually utter those words in court. She cut him off. Uh, because of time. Well, because I think the reason, I, perhaps I stand corrected, but I think the reason was that these words actually weren't in his written statement. But he was telling the truth. Well, we invite uh, Harding and... The editor of The Guardian on uh, to explain uh, its behavior. I'm sure they'll deny uh, mm. completely any mm. uh, secret agenda. Mm. It has to be said that Joe Biden, the Democrat contender for the presidency of the United States, says uh, that Julian Assange was, uh, was like a high-tech terrorist. He called him a cyber terrorist, yes. Well, what would you expect? I mean, Trump, Biden... I mean, Trump, Trump is on the record for saying he doesn't know anything about WikiLeaks. It's not my thing. I know there is something uh, having to do with Julian Assange. Who, who knows what Trump knows about? Who knows what he says is true that minute? And it'll, it changes the next. I do know that what came out very clearly from these few days, from, sorry, these few weeks in court, was that uh, Assange was on trial for journalism and that many other journalists have done exactly what he did, and that is uh, publish uh, the uh, Ar Ar Iraq and uh, Afghanistan war diaries. Um, uh, one website published it well before even WikiLeaks. The Guardian published them. The prosecution uh, said the Times. The, the prosecution them. said WikiLeaks has more reach, even if WikiLeaks published them later. But they they all published the same thing, and the. The 1917 Espionage Act, 103 years ago, which has never been used against a journalist because in the United States, the journalist and free journalism is meant to be protected by the Constitution. This is the first time it's been used, the first time. Uh, and in my view, if they get away with this, if they send Assange across the Atlantic, it won't be the last time, it will be the beginning who will be next? You did detect, somewhat hopefully, some kind of change in the last two days of this four-week hearing at the Old Bailey. Uh, Could you tell me a little bit about that? Um, my sense was that British justice has been so trashed by this trial and all the so-called case management proceedings before it that an innocent man, a man whose only crime has been bail infringement for which he received an unheard of uh, sentence of almost a year in a maximum security prison with murderers and convicted terrorists. Uh, my sense is they may feel it's gone a bit too far because everyone going into that court, lawyers, those of us who've been in many courts around the world, uh, can no longer put the two words British and justice together. Uh, there hasn't been due process in this court 
there has been due revenge. Uh, now, certainly in the last few days, there appears, there has appeared to be a loosening up, allowing of, for instance, the, the, the defense and prosecution are allowed a whole month to make their, uh, their closing statements, but still they can't make them, they can't argue them in court, they can only make them on paper. And, uh, and Judge Baratza will give her decision on the 4th of January, I understand. Uh, but the whole dreadful drama uh, and the, the arguing against the, um, what Professor Niels Melser, the UN reporter on torture, has called arguing against the very fact, the obvious fact, of the psychological torture of this journalist and publish, publisher who told us about war crimes. He told us about war crimes. He told us about how governments lies. That, that's, journalism has been recast, literally, as espionage. Not espionage in the country you come from, or even the country you publish from, this country, but in another country, the United States. What has gone is sovereignty, that, that American jurisdiction can cross any ocean and reach into uh, any country, any journalist. Just imagine it, reverse it. China doing that. China with its own equivalent Assange case. Russia. Can you imagine the outrage? It would never happen. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, he's an Australian citizen. You were born in Australia. If he's extradited to a Virginia court to face a 175-year uh, sentence, uh, if found guilty, I mean, would you be able to be a journalist anymore? <laughs> On pain of <laughs> I've anymore. I've, I don't. <laughs> Sorry, I don't wish to give a frivolous answer. As that's what I do, and I regard it as a constant privilege. But if a source to be a journalist, you, of course. If a source gave be, you information that pertained to U.S. It. security, I would try and find somewhere where it'd be published. I doubt whether a, these days whether a, a newspaper would do it. Yes. Thus making yourself yes, liable for what, possible... It's, the sound has done what the best journalists have done. And they all know. They've, they've, they've come into court to, you know, people like uh, Nicky Hager and, and, uh, and others have come into court, Patrick Coburn, to talk about journalism. But there's, certainly, there's certainly no going underground if he's extradited, arguably, because obviously we've been publicising and covering all of this. I've got to ask you then, given that it's a month now for that evidence, then it's the decision by Baratza on January the 4th, 2021, and then perhaps an appeal to the High Court and so forth. How, given that we now know about smuggled in razor blades into Belmarsh Prison by Julian Assange, the suicide risk that he presents, can he, can he last? I don't know. I can't speculate on that. Uh, I, whenever I've seen Julian in Belmarsh, and when I first went to see him after he was, after he was uh, thrown out of the Ecuadorian embassy, one of the first things he said was, uh, I think I'm losing my mind. And I found myself reassuring him that he wasn't. His resilience is absolutely astonishing, and that, he, and that includes courage, of course. But what we did learn, and I have to say it shocked me, that some of the despair, the punishment has worked on him, that some of the despair that he has had to endure during this. Uh, I think if he's freed, he'll recover. He is a strong personality. He is a political prisoner. Political prisoners, as they, they knew on uh, Robben Island and in so many other places, can recover. Perhaps not everything, but a substantial part of them, because they're there for a principle. One of the things that's always been neglected about WikiLeaks is that it started with a, a rather moral aim, that, that politicians should be accountable, that's th that they should, in a democracy, they should be accountable to us. I know he felt that very passionately, right from the beginning. Um, so he has that. He feels strongly about that. Uh, but it's been 10 years of incarceration of one kind or another. 
And uh, this last year, or this last, uh, whatever it is, 15 months in this dreadful place, Belmarsh, has just been horrendous. It's, it's just uh, in the land of Magna Carta. What a, what a shame.